Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to MotorWeek podcast number 219. Joining me in Studio C at MotorWeek World Headquarters is writer Brian Robinson. It's truly a pleasure, John. Over the edge reporter Greg Carlos. Hey, hey. And head writer and newly appointed senior executive producer really? Dave Scrivener. Happy to be Yay. here. I did not see that press release. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't not put you ahead of that. Robinson because I, that order is completely out of order. Yeah. Actually, I think sorry. it's exactly right. No, just kidding. Uh, we've got a long list of things to get through today. Three vehicles that we've driven recently, a lightning round. We have a very unusual and special viewer question. We'll see if anybody's got a rant and rave. But let's start with a vehicle that kind of flies in the face of what's happening in reality, the 2020 Subaru Legacy. It's all new, uh, midsize sedan in the face of basically midsize sedan sales continuing to fall, although some think they're starting to level off. All-wheel drive standard, of course, a little bit larger than it was before. So what do we think? Still playing it safe, as always, for Subaru. <laughs> you mean styling-wise? Styling-wise and performance. I think they know their audience and they key into that. And now, the engine we had was the base 2.5. There's also a turbo that we actually tried out later in the Outback. Slow and slower. So <coughs> wow. did you find, though, that it's adequate? And I, and I no, asked absolutely, that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For most of the Subaru owners. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but between the low power and the CVT, it's just not a very rewarding driving experience. Uh, but it's still a very, very comfortable vehicle, uh, pleasant to drive in all aspects. And uh, they did, I think they definitely took the interior up a notch. Yeah. Uh, it's got the bigger screen. All the tech is much easier to use. Finally. Uh, I mean, that was actually a big problem they had before. And, uh, yeah, seats are comfortable. Uh, you get standard um, uh, emergency braking with the eyesight. And yeah, so if you absolutely don't want a wagon, you don't want the Outback version of this vehicle, then I guess you would uh, opt for the Legacy. I think it's a real bargain. Yeah, there's. I mean, it, if you're looking for a family car and you don't want an SUV, which hardly anybody is apparently, uh, it's a great choice. It has a ton of space. I mean, I was able to put yep. a kid seat in the back. I mean, that's rear facing with no problems. Like everybody else said, the seats are comfortable. Um, the, the the big screen I think is fine. I don't necessarily love the We're big not screen and going all them. in on like yeah. everything being controlled through the screen. I'll take knobs over that still. Yes, please. But uh, you know I think it, it presents well, um, and you know to the point of it being conservative and maybe a tad boring. I think that's probably still what they want. They want to sell vehicles and. You know, if you don't push people too far in one direction or the other, they'll probably be able to do so. Speaking of boring, I've actually got a, a 2012 Outback, so it's two generations back, and it's got the standard four-cylinder engine in it. So compared to that, this car has noticeably more power, especially on the low end. So this is, you know, non-turbo versus non-turbo, of course. And uh, the CVT shifts better or has simulated shifts that are better. A little less engine noise at the top end. But you know, the biggest thing I noticed is the seats are more comfortable and the steering actually has something, some semblance of feel, which in my Outback, it's pretty much as a doornail. So uh, I think it's a good improvement and the all wheel drive, I think makes it very attractive. And obviously that's a trend that they've started. It's taken a long time coming, but now with Altima and uh, Camry adding all wheel drive, you can see, um, how important that's going to be in the future. So we like it. It continues well. And um, between the Legacy and the Outback, they're two interesting vehicles. Speaking of all-wheel drive, 2020 Volvo V60 Cross Country. Um, I've forgotten what generation this is of the <laughs> using the Cross Country name. But, you know, Cross Country simply means a tiny bit more ground clearance and some black cladding and yada, yada. But... Nice vehicle, everybody. I mean, I enjoyed driving it. Yeah, I um, I had it for a weekend, and 
thoroughly enjoyed it. It had the space I needed. Um, you know, I, I enjoy a wagon. I enjoy the. Uh, it's not the too big. It's not too small. It's not too big. I would say I would maybe like it just a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know You're V90. A tall guy too. Yeah, exactly. A V90 would probably suit me a little bit better. But uh, for most people, I think it's fine. Great technology. Greg is Greg is not normal height. I'm not normal in any well. aspect of my life. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, just a really pleasant car to drive. And this one also has a big screen, which it, the execution is. Um, probably a little bit more refined than the Subaru. We but more complicated, about. I think. More complicated, for sure. And there's some things that, you know, given Volvo's demographic, which probably leans a little bit older, uh, there's a lot of really small font mm -hmm. in, in buttons on there that I think are really, even for me, and I have pretty good vision, and I'm, you know, uh, I, I just think that it's odd that they would put so much on one screen that it's really hard to sift through at a quick glance. And they really don't have a whole lot of redundant controls. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, actually, that would be the one thing that I would fault it on is maybe it's gone a little bit too far on the big screen, all, everything and controls. Yeah, we were talking about the out Outback. This is basically a Volvo version of the Outback, mm -hmm. all-wheel drive wagon. The uh, it's every single Volvo vehicle now, except for the XC40, is all based on that SPA chassis that debuted with the XC90. So this is just another version of that. Uh, I'm not sure. Price-wise, it comes in right about the same as the XC60. So uh, I'm not sure unless you really want a wagon while you're going, while you go this route. Plus, you can only get the turbo version of the two-liter. You can't get the turbo and supercharged version, much less the plug-in T8 version. You can only get the base. I wonder why T5 they did that. Version. I mean, they basically, you know, think, do you think just. I they didn't want the complexity the yeah, and the price just to down. Keep the price. Yeah. They did try to differentiate it from the others a little bit inside. I thought it wasn't like over the top luxurious <clears> like the XC60 is. They had it a little more. I don't want to use the word family, but it was just a little more, uh, uh, just not over the top. It was. Luxurious. It was nice. You felt like you were in a, a very nice car, but you didn't feel yeah. particularly yeah. luxurious. You didn't feel like you had to constantly wipe your feet before yeah. getting in the car. <laughs> That's a good way. Or but, polish yeah. all the wood trim. Mm -hmm. um, I used to own a, um, an old V70 cross country, and we really loved it. And I thought this was a nice evolution of that basic, you know, concept. Mm -hmm. And let's see, Outback um, V60. Are there any more station wagons you can even buy? E class. Doesn't the E still have a wagon? Uh, yep. Yeah, I think so. And the uh, Jag. Jag. Oh, and the Jag. Yeah, yeah that's right. Well, I like that one. Sport yeah. Brake. Is that called? Yeah, yeah. XF Sport Brake, and then the Bu uh, Buick Regal. Uh, while you can. Yeah, uh, I heard that's getting axed. Yeah, it's getting axed. I'm sure there's still some out there. Moving on, 2020 Mercedes-Benz GLB. Dave, you had a chance to drive it. I was out in Phoenix a few weeks ago to drive tell, that. Tell us actually what it is, because that's a new this nomenclature. is their new, they call it a gateway Ooh. to the three-passenger <laughs> SUV. It fits in between the GLA and the GLC, a very small niche there. Huh. Um, it doesn't have the cute ute styling, and it has the long roof boxier styling you'd see on the GLS class or the GLE, which we love. Um, it shares a platform with the um, CLA, the new A class mm -hmm. and CLA. Um, so it's, uh, it has the big boy styling, but in a small boy package. Does it work? It works. The third row seat, we didn't actually have a third row tester in the one we drove, but they say it's available. Um, the rear that's got to be pretty that's, cramped, that's gotta though. Tight, gotta man. be tight yeah, back. Like Volkswagen mm -hmm. Tiguan style. Yeah. Yeah. They do have the second row, so you can slide back and forth to allow more cargo space or more leg room for the second row if you're not having a third row passenger aboard. Um, 221 horsepower from the two liter turbo i4. 258 is your torque. Uh, we drove it um, from Phoenix up to Sedona and back, and it was a little out of breath on some of the elevation parts. You know, it was a little wheezy kind of engine for that you know, size of an SUV. It's still going to haul seven people around. You want some oomph behind you. It's adequate for most situations. They seem to be making a real press to expand again into the lower part of the market. They I mean, want more, they're talking about a lot about the gateway. They said, yeah. you know, the, the, um, the original, they brought out the little CLA coupe. It expanded. Mm -hmm. A lot of those people were repeat buyers and bought bigger Mercedes, basically. Like 70% right. of those buyers stayed bought, in stayed in the family. And they're like, well, let's do more entry stuff and get them hooked as they uh -huh. would and keep them in the brand. Uh, starts at 38.6 for 4Matic. 
all the ones we drove were over like 48 to 50. Mm. Easily add up quickly. Uh, I like the styling, the big, long styling, more so than the little cute utes, which aren't very useful to me cargo-wise and just don't appeal to me. So size-wise, it's smaller than the GLC? Well, I think the GLC of... is more of one of those little roundy back. Uh, well, there's things. a coupe version. And then but there's, there's also a square SUV back version. version, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit smaller than I mean, we're, it's just another case of them slicing it very it's, narrow. It's just but, to slice the yeah. pile a little slice thinner for that little However, niche who wants a third row entry level. It's it's yeah. built on a substantially probably less expensive chassis mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Correct? I mean. Uh, I think it's the same. If it's the GLC, it's the it's same. C, C, is, yeah. C is the same. That's also on the A? The same as the uh, CLA chassis. Okay. Well, slice them thinner. They're obviously working. Their sales are doing just fine. Mm hmm Let's move on now to our lightning round. We each of us have about 30 seconds to give uh, our take on a trending automotive topic. Uh, we really don't keep time on this anymore. It's just kind of fun to see, talk about what's new. Uh, we were in Detroit for Chevy's unveiling of the all-new 2021 Tahoe and Suburban. Styling changes bring them more up to date. You know, slab-sided, looks a lot like uh, Ford uh, Expedition in some ways. Uh, much more room on the inside. Uh, the third row seat on the Tahoe, I think it's got um, a great, I wanted to quote a number, but it's got a lot more rear leg room. They've switched to a inches. independent uh, rear suspension, 10 inches more in the more third row. Room or in the third row. That can't um, be right leg room. Third row or second row? Third row. Third row. Third row, That's yeah. For adults. Uh, Six-cylinder turbo diesel option. Uh, I haven't seen it. I've seen the pictures. It actually, I don't think, looks too bad. I does kind it of have was, a huge grill from the Silverado. It grill. does, Oof. but it sort of works a little a bit better. Teeth, uh, it has um, uh, LED accent lights that that kind of make it, I think, a little less uh, thing, in your face. Go ahead. The thing about that grill is that if you configure it right, you can make it look good. There are some right. configurations where it really looks bad, uh, but there are others where you add some LEDs or maybe a touch of different color and it, it, it does start black it out a little bit. Out. The, the huge um, chrome one is just, oof. It's much. got an awful lot of tech in it. It's going to have MagnaRide suspension, which they've not had before, and some other suspension tricks. Here's the bottom line. 1.7% of all vehicles sold in this country are Tahoes or Suburban. That's the same amount of vehicles that all your electric cars sold in this country make up. Mm -hmm. This is an incredibly uh, valuable vehicle to GM. This is going to fund their electric car you know, situation. They've lost a lot of sales to Navigator and Expedition. They need those sales back. Mm -hmm. We know, of course, there's going to be a GMC and a Cadillac Escalade version of it. So from what you saw and what you've read, what do you think? I'll be shopping one. My uh, my Yukon XL Denali just uh, <clears throat> bit the dust. <laughs> After? 185,000 yeah, miles. Okay, you got your use out of it. And let go, finally. I'm shopping for that probably middle of the year. I'm going to buy an interim car in the meantime. Mm -hmm. um, what I can do with that. But big I'll look ten, at it. Big 10-inch screen sitting on top of the dash. Which, personally, I like it better than down below, so I'm kind of, like, glad that they didn't join the crowd and stick yeah. it down below. <clears throat> For use, I think it's better up top. I don't Glare particularly wise. like the way it looks. but uh, You don't? Because yeah. it sort of has that Hyundai Kia, mm -hmm. you know, kind yeah. of curved shape to it. But you're right, though. When you need to use a touchscreen, it's better to have it yeah. up and, and in your field of view. In the field of view is nice, yeah. So um, we haven't, our judgment is still out until we have a chance to drive them. But they look like they're a good answer to um, um, the uh, Ford entries. Uh, right now, I think it's almost 60% of all the full-size SUVs come from General Motors, and they need to keep that up. So we'll have the full road test when we get a chance to actually drive it. Not too long for now, hopefully. Moving on to our viewer question. Roberto Lopez, this very, very nice man wrote us an unusual, it's not really a question, but I'll read it. He said that he's losing his vision, so he's not going to be able to see the information on our car repair much longer. So he's a big fan of Pat Goss. He'd like to thank us for all the great information on repairs and others that he's given us throughout his many years. Well, Roberto, I don't know what to say except thank you very much. And one of the 
things I hope you will continue to listen to us because we put a great deal of emphasis on the spoken word. And Pat Goss, having been a teacher in his early life, he also puts a great deal of, uh, uh, of, of thought into what he says. So you don't always, you don't always need the pictures. They're, they're nice to have. They complete everything. But if you still have a chance to listen to us, I hope you'll still be informed and entertained. And um, I wish you the best. Very nice. Very nice comment. Ah, with that said, does anybody have a rant or rave? I don't think we should rant after a nice no, comment. I don't, I don't rave about a comment like that. Yeah. So it makes you feel good, especially me coming from the digital side of Motor Week and reading a lot of comments. You can really kind of lose your, your passion when people are so critical after a while. Everybody's so, so critical. Uh, but, it, you know, when I, I, I read this one and decided to include it because I thought everybody could probably use a little pick-me-up. I thought it was just a really nice note, and I appreciate that. Anybody else? Oh, I'm good. All right. These Pat segments for the last 20 years, and thanks for watching and listening. And if you had any idea how much hair Dave loses during the Pat Goss production. Not all my hair. Yeah, well, it grows. It's, it's grown back. It's grown back a little, a little blonder. More indeed. silver and blonder. <clears throat> all right, that wraps up, I think, our MotorWeek podcast number 219. I want to thank Brian Robinson, Greg Carlos, and, of course, Dave Scrivener. And I also want to thank our audio engineer, Dave Wainwright, who is responsible for so much of the audio on our program, our podcast producer, Greg, of course, and podcast creator, Bob Mixter. Thanks to all of you for watching Motor Week on public TV stations across the country, also for finding us on the Motor Trend cable network, and for you nearly 2.5 million folks a month that watch us on YouTube. Thank you very much for being such supportive fans. Indeed, I'm John Davis. Thank you all for being a part of Motor Week. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. <laughs>